on Issues and Insiders today, we touch upon a host of K-pop related headlines ranging from new albums to exhibitions in the US to plans for a new concert arena. Do stay tuned. Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Issues and Insiders for July 17th here in South Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. Much has been happening on the K-pop front in recent days. And for details on the latest events, I have Bernie Jo, the head of DFSB Collective, live on the line. Bernie, it's been a while. Welcome back. No, it's good to be back. I also have entertainment reporter Tamar Herman with us as well. Tamar, it's good to have you on. Thanks so much for having me. Bernie, the wisdom of the words, absence makes the heart grow fonder, appears to be true for BTS. What do you suppose is this boy band's secret to staying in the headlines despite its absence from the stage as a group? Well, you know, for BTS, even while on hiatus, you know, they managed to somehow stay in the headlines worldwide, week to week, month to month, year to year. I actually don't think it's so much of a secret, but if anything, more of a surprise in how they surpassed both critical and commercial expectations. Um, if I were the script writer, I would probably go back to the drawing board and maybe perhaps pick out two other proverbs, divide and conquer, and one step back, two steps forward. And what I mean by divide and conquer, let's face it, the band was divided not because of internal strife, but due to each member having to fulfill their mandatory military duty. But by no means did such national service lead to a dip, a drop, or, or even a dive in their popularity. Um, if I had to sort of highlight some of the things that BTS did, not just so much as a band, but as solo artists that really stood out, I have to say right from the get-go were uh, very high profile collaborations. You had Jungkook and Lato coming out with a monster hit that just charted worldwide, uh, hitting the big stages. Um, again, Jungkook was able to promote his singles and albums on stages that, you know, frankly, I we would never thought the band would even do both uh, doing a, a surprise gig in New York City's Times Square and also opening um, for the FIFA World Cup. Another thing that BTS didn't do, but as solo artists we started seeing them do, was performing on the big stages at outdoor festivals. Uh, J-Hope absolutely rocked it at Lollapalooza. And although the band wasn't there in person, but virtually they were beamed in, um, pre-recorded, for a Coldplay collaboration just recently at Glastonbury. Another thing that I saw that I think really helped the band, but more importantly, the band members, was appearing on late night talk shows. For instance, with uh, the late night talk show with Jimmy Fallon, both Jimin and Sugar took stages there. Uh, and then another thing is in order to go big, it turns out RMNV actually went small. They did the uh, legendary NPR Tiny Desk concerts. And in order to kind of keep the band really fresh in the minds of fans, fans and perhaps new fans, uh, you heard a lot of BTS tracks appear on big blockbuster Hollywood soundtracks, whether it was Fast X, The Eternals, or just recently uh, Despicable Me 4. And last but not least, you have uh, Jin, who just got out of the military, the first one out, uh, holding the torch, bearing the torch for the upcoming Paris Olympics. Um, and again, falling back on this idea of one step back, two steps forward, you know, as a band, BTS broke a lot of records and in some instances, they broke their own records. But as solo artists, they actually broke even more records as K-pop solo artists. And so before BTS went into the military, arguably without any argument, they were the biggest boy band in the world. But in light of all the successful solo ventures that each and every member had during this military hiatus, when they get back together next year, uh, they're they're not going to be just a boy band in many ways. They're going to go back and become, um, if anything, a super group. Right, and staying with solo ventures, Tamara, how do you explain the hype of RM's second solo, Right Place, Wrong Person, there in the US? Uh, yeah, and if I just may add, before diving into RM's album, I actually, for my newsletter a few months ago, I was looking into how frequent the releases of BTS were during the enlistment. And since Jin enlisted in December 2022, there was almost a release from the group either of new music or a documentary every single month. So, like, they kept active. It was not absent makes the heart grow fonder. It was, here, we have a new way to make your heart grow fonder. Um, and so I think RM's album is kind of one of the biggest accolades that we've gotten out of this. Um, his Right Place, Wrong Person album is the latest in RM's very introspective very philosophical albums where he discusses where he's at in his life through a variety of different 
musical genres and with a variety of different collaborators. And this album has particularly been really well received by music critics in the US and of course the fans. Um, because it's quite innovative and explores many, many different genres and his collaborators are quite unique and a little bit, um, I wouldn't say atypical, but new to many um, people who might be familiar with RM's music as BTS. And so this album is quite innovative. Um, I think we, uh, I saw Billboard's review of his album as one of the top albums of 2024 so far, was comparing to him many greats across many genres. Uh, the album itself really speaks to uh, RM's creativity as a as an artist and as a somebody who has become known for the way he thinks, um, and I think that's really what's capturing everyone's attention here. Right, Tamara, Jimin is also poised to release his second solo Muse, I believe, this coming Friday. What can we expect? Do you think? Uh, I expect Jimin to do quite well. Also, um, his album is hopefully going to be quite similarly as well received. Um, he released his album Face a few years ago, and that was a bit of a darker album. This album so far seems to be much breezier. He released uh, two pre-releases, one a few months ago, uh, closer than this, and then he released recently a collaboration with Loco called Smeraldo Garden Marching Band. Um, and if that title doesn't tip you off to the kind of the vibes of the album, it's very uh, evocative of, you know, the Beatles' yellow submarine era. It's very festive and colorful and bright. Uh, there's a lot of focus on kind of the breeziness of this album and the growth that Jimin has um, experienced as an artist. So if the first album was a little bit dark and introspective, this one seems to be in a brighter place, continuing to show him as a blooming artist. So it's um, I, for one, am looking forward to listening to it. Right. Bernie, as you mentioned then, this strategy of divide and conquer, one step back, two steps forward, has kept BTS on the radar. Do you foresee a similar strategy by other K-pop bands in the future? Well, you know, again, if we look at sort of historically, traditionally, how Korean music companies or, or artist management companies dealt with the issue of mandatory military service for boy bands or, for that matter, male artists, uh, this was something that, you know, frankly speaking, a, a lot of um, artists and their companies really wrestled with and struggled with. Uh, some of them, you know, even got in trouble or even got arrested for trying to do anything and everything in their power to avoid going to the military because often going to the military was synonymous as sort of being a career kiss of death. Now, many artists reluctantly went to the military and hoped and prayed that once they got out that their fans would still be there. What I think was incredibly impressive about what BTS and HYBE and Big Hit did with this is that they didn't run away from the military. And, you know, look, God knows there were plenty of rumors saying that they might be able to get out of it in some way, shape or form. I think what was really important in, and, and a real big takeaway and a lesson learned was um, BTS leaned into the fact they went to the military and really laid out, they mapped out and strategized how they were going to handle the band being disbanded during this momentary, you know, uh, lapse of, uh, you know, being a band and really focus on developing each and every member in many ways fairly, objectively and equally. And I know for me, um, the being able to see how each of these members truly became artists in their own right, with their own distinct style, their own distinct voice, uh, their own distinct character, um, I think really is, uh, you know, they've really written the playbook moving forward for the rest of the industry to say, look, going to the military may not even hurt. It actually might help the careers of these particular artists. And, you know, look, you know, for BTS, you know, look, let's face it, they are global superstars. And generally speaking, for big global bands, 18 months off is usually just basically just taking a rest from one album cycle where you drop an album, you promote it, you market it, you tour it. And so for many ways, I think, you know, BTS really took advantage of this one album cycle, 18 month period uh, to really um, build the brand where in many ways, I think, uh, you know, what we're seeing and we're going to see is really a one plus one equals three uh, effect when BTS gets back together as a full band uh, next year. Right. Tamar, the Grammy Museum, it's supposed to host a K-pop exhibition with BTS's agency, HYBE. Do tell us a bit about this particular museum and what has been shared about this upcoming exhibition thus far? 
the Grimm Museum is a museum run by the Recording Academy in downtown Los Angeles, and it has its own permanent exhibition with many interesting artifacts and clothing from many of the biggest names in music historically. Um, I visited last year, and there was, you know, their standing exhibit and a Shakira exhibit, and that's the sort of thing that we are expecting to see with this Hive one. They currently have an 80s exhibit, the other another group, another K-pop group, excuse me, um, right now. And this new exhibit, Hive We Believe in Music, is opening on August 2nd, and it will run through mid-September. It's going to feature artifacts and um, an, uh, a walk through the career of Hive's artists and explore what the company has done over the past few years. The, uh, the um, exhibit will focus on their act, current acts under many different labels. Bernie, generally speaking, what do you believe are the broader implications of this K-pop exhibition by the Grammy Museum there in L.A.? Well, you know, I think it's uh, twofold and perhaps maybe multi-layered. Number one is um, not just BTS, but HYBE in general. Whenever they do pop-up shops, or and, and they've done many, many exhibitions, these have been huge sellout events. And so I'm sure uh, the people over at the uh, Grammys are fully aware that uh, BTS, but more importantly, the high portfolio of artists are going to sell tickets and bring audiences to that particular space and venue. Now, I actually uh, see something kind of um, maybe perhaps a little different. I see two huge dots on the wall, and I think there is an invisible ink or pencil that might be connecting those two dots. Um, last month, uh, the Korea Times, they actually broke a story that um, an Asian version of the Grammy Awards might be held in Korea. Now, of course, all the sources were anonymous. No one wanted to name names, but yet a lot of names were thrown out there, but no one was willing to openly confirm, but yet we're confirming, quote unquote, off the record. Um, apparently, Korea and Japan are on the short list for hosting an Asian Grammy Awards. Um, last month, it was reported that the Recording Academy president, Panos Panay, and the CEO, Harvey Mason Jr., visited Korea. They not only met with uh, numerous music and technology companies such as Kakao, Hybe, YG, they met with and, uh, CJ e &M, but they also met with Naver, Korea Telecom, and more importantly, various government officials. And again, without no, no one naming names, um, but it was confirmed by the Korea Times that um, three cities are currently under consideration for hosting a potential Asian Grammy Awards. Uh, it's Seoul, Incheon, and Hanam. And again, for a so-called rumor to have these details leak out, um, I think it, there's where there's smoke, there's fire. And I think this particular story is incredibly lit. I think there's a high chance that the Grammy Awards may be staged in Korea, and what better way to kind of uh, tease it and soft sell it and, and, and perhaps maybe ramp up the hype is having an exhibition at the Grammy Museum here in Los Angeles. Right, that really is some exciting news actually, Bernie. So the three uh, potential cities, Seoul, Incheon, and Hanam, you say? Correct. Hanam mm. in Gyeonggi province, not in uh, downtown Seoul. <laughs> right, of course. Bernie, moving forward, there's been a bit of talk about the absence of new genes at this upcoming uh, K-pop exhibition in, at the Grammy Museum. What can you tell us about the response so far? Yeah, no, I mean, there's a bit of confusion, and it's really about the choice of words. I mean, I've seen reports saying that in some way, shape, or form, New Jeans was quote-unquote excluded. Uh, they were by no means excluded. Um, in fact, the invitation was extended to all of HYBE, and HYBE, in turn, extended these invitations to all of the sub-labels within HYBE, including Adore. And although the Grammy Museum uh, wanted to have Adore and New Jeans in the exhibition, and there was some talk about perhaps giving them some prime space at the entryway of the museum, again, from unnamed sources, uh, but um, for whatever reason, and for a wide range of reasons, which we could probably easily suspect as to why, Adore declined the invitation to be part of this particular exhibition. 
And again, um, you know, that's their choice. High by no means excluded them. You know, they extended that same invitation like they did to everybody. Uh, but, you know, some industry pundits in some of the local press have uh, stated that perhaps maybe uh, the bad blood between Hybe and Adore is still lingering. And perhaps maybe that's the reason why Adore declined to be part of this exhibition and be part of the Hybe portfolio. But for whatever reason, let's face it, even though New Jeans is not necessarily going to be there at that exhibition, there are going to be 12 acts that are going to have their highlights showcased and featured. So, you know, for fans of K-pop and for fans of Hive, there's going to be plenty to see, but unfortunately, uh, a new jeans exhibit within this particular uh, special exhibition of Hive uh, will not be making an appearance. Right, much to the disappointment of fans of new jeans, of course. Tamar, come in the year 2027, so we'll see a K-pop concert hall that is capable of hopefully accommodating some 28,000 fans. How do you respond to this latest venture? Um, I think it might be a case of a little too, uh, too little too late. Excuse me, sorry, it's very late here. Um, Seoul and South Korea in general need some large venues, but 2027, we already have seen K-pop concerts or just general music concerts are taking off in Korea right now. There is a need right now. So waiting until 2027 for a sizable venue is great. Um, but we just saw that this is the cacao-funded arena and there's a CJ-funded similar project that has fallen through. So I think that there is... And this itself has been delayed several times, so I believe that there is some sort of feelings that maybe this is coming a little bit after the moment. Um, not to say that K-pop will not still need concert venues, but I also think that, and this is maybe the even more thing, the idea of creating a arena just for music is really admirable as somebody who loves music. Uh, but arena, typically concert venues are also shared with either other performing arts spaces or with sports. So usually a arena is actually a sports arena and concerts are held there. So usually if nowadays modern arenas and modern stadiums are built in tandem, so the plan is to be mostly a sport, sporting arena and then they will also be capable of having concerts and the acoustics and obviously everything else taken into account. Having a nearly 30,000 capacity arena simply for music is, Sounds glorious, but I'm kind of curious to see if they'll be able to fill it 365 days a year. It seems to be asking a lot of the music industry to me. But yeah. I think also it could also bring a lot of foreign acts. I don't know if that's the plan, but if you have this venue just for K-pop, you might be able to spread to other sort of artists as well. Right, hopefully. Bernie, an ongoing K-pop dance challenge on social platforms has ignited debate about the copyright protection for choreographers here in the country. What is the reality here? Uh, actually, uh, there is no copyright protection because there are no copyrights for choreography. Uh, this is actually a huge issue that uh, the Korean Ministry of Culture has actually been studying. And in fact, in December, uh, it, it went really without much notice, but the Korean Ministry of Culture stated in December that they were going to look into ways and means for choreography, which everyone knows is an important part of K-pop and its exports uh, power worldwide. How can choreography uh, not only be protected, but promoted vis-a-vis -vis through copyright? Rights. Now, um, this issue has really blown up big because of the Hybe Adore scandal, because at that time, uh, Minnie Jin, the CEO of Adore, openly accused uh, a, a fellow sub-label um, band of uh, copyright plagiarism of choreography. The problem is, at this time, there are no copyright laws or protections for choreography. But that being said, uh, the Korean Ministry of Culture has decided to accelerate the discussion related to how to create copyright guidelines, uh, standards, and practices. And currently, uh, many of the top Korean choreographers in the K-pop uh, space have formed their own association uh, called, appropriately enough, the Korean Choreography Copyright Association, and they're working very closely with the Ministry of Culture on coming up with ways and means to identify uh, plagiarism in choreography, 
um, and also how to um, register copyrights for choreography and moving forward, how to monitor, but more importantly, um, how to help choreographers monetize uh, their original intellectual property works. And what's really sad was um, I, the Korean Jungang Ilbo, not that they're in any way, shape or form sad, but they wrote an excellent article recently about the state of dance copyrights in Korea. And what really stunned me and what really shocked me is currently in the database for the Korean uh, copyrights, less than 0.06% of all copyrights are related to dance and none of those copyrights are related to K-pop dance. And so um, the government has made it known that they're gonna try to come up with policies related to copyright uh, promotion and protection for choreography. And if Korea manages to figure it out, they will be, Korea will be the first major music market in the world that will create uh, copyright um, guidelines for choreography. Right, and that being said, Tamara, for the sake of some comparison then, what can you tell us about dance copyrights there in the US? So in the U.S., choreography is considered uh, a protected category under copyright law. It's usually considered not necessarily a single dance move or something um, that, you know, you'll just do randomly, like, you know, you can't, like, fist bump and say, that's mine now. Um, it has to be an entire performance, typically performed visibly elsewhere. So, like, if you recorded something, if you recorded a whole choreography. So K-pop dances in the U.S. would essentially fall under the category because it's a song it's a dance number specifically for a song um so there are songs that are um copywritten and such as uh, beyonce's single ladies i believe is uh, protected under copyright law law but like bernie said um enacting the law is quite difficult because people don't typically want to bring cases to court and because there's not a lot of guidelines regarding what it exactly how to enforce this copyright most of the cases in the U.S., I think actually all of the cases in the U.S. so far have either been thrown out or the parties have come to a probably monetary conclusion. Uh, there was some sizable cases against the gaming uh, company that runs Fortnite for stealing some dances allegedly, and all those cases just went nowhere. There's not really any sort of good consensus on how to uh, penalize anyone who has stolen the dances or how to even really keep track of them. There is a way, of course, to file the copyright for choreography and it is protected in the U.S., but it, as Bernie said, there's no guidelines and there's no real way to enforce the law in this right. case. Well, hopefully negotiations here in South Korea will lead to some kind of gu guideline for the broader society then. All right, Tamara, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Bernie, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Right. Well, that is all the time we have for this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow.